Welcome back to A People's History of the United States. This is Chapter 1, Part 2. Written by Howard Zinn, read by Sen Naomi Kirschultz. Cortes then began his march of death from town to town using deception, turning Aztec against Aztec, killing with the kind of deliberateness that accompanies a strategy, to paralyze the will of the population by a sudden, frightful deed. And so, in Cholulu, he invited the headmen of the Cholula nation to the square, and when they came, with thousands of unarmed retainers, Cortes's small army of Spaniards posted around the square with cannon, armed with crossbows, mounted on horses, massacred them down to the last man. Then, they looted the city and moved on. When their cavalcade of murder was over, they were in Mexico City. Montezuma was dead, and the Aztec civilization, shattered, was in the hands of the Spaniards. All of this is told in the Spaniards' own accounts. In Peru, that other Spanish conquistador, Pizarro, used the same tactics and for the same reasons, the frenzy in the early capitalist states of Europe for gold, for slaves, for products of the soil, to pay the bondholders and stockholders of the expeditions, to finance the monarchical bureaucracies rising in Western Europe, to spur the growth of the new money economy rising out of feudalism, to participate in what Karl Marx would later call, quote, the primitive accumulation of capital, unquote. These were the violent beginnings of an intricate system of technology, business, politics, and culture that would dominate the world for the next five centuries. In the North American English colonies, the pattern was set early as Columbus had set it in the islands of the Bahamas. In 1585, before there was any permanent English settlement in Virginia, Richard Grenville landed there with seven ships. The Indians he met were hospitable, but when one of them stole a small silver cup, Grenville sacked and burned the whole Indian village. Jamestown itself was set up inside the territory of an Indian confederacy led by the chief, Powhatan. Powhatan watched the English settle on his people's land but did not attack, maintaining a posture of coolness. When the English were going through their, quote, starving time, unquote, in the winter of 1610, some of them ran off to join the Indians where they would at least be fed. When the summer came, the governor of the colony sent a messenger to ask Powhatan to return the runaways, whereupon Powhatan, according to the English account, replied with, quote, no other than proud and disdainful answers, unquote. Some soldiers were therefore sent out, quote, to take revenge, unquote. They fell upon an Indian settlement, killed 15 or 16 Indians, burned the houses, cut down the corn growing around the village, took the queen of the tribe and her children into boats, then ended up throwing the children overboard, quote, and shooting out their brains in the water, unquote. The queen was later taken off and stabbed to death. Twelve years later, the Indians, alarmed as the English settlements kept growing in numbers, apparently decided to try to wipe them out for good. They went on a rampage and massacred 347 men, women, and children. And from then on, it was total war. Not able to enslave the Indians and not able to live with them, the English decided to exterminate them. Edmund Morgan writes in his history of early Virginia, American slavery, American freedom, Quote, Since the Indians were better woodsmen than the English, and virtually impossible to track down, the method was to feign peaceful intentions, let them settle down and plant their corn wherever they chose, and then, just before harvest, fall upon them, killing as many as possible and burning the corn. Within two or three years of the massacre, the English had avenged the deaths of that day many times over." Unquote. In that first year of the white man in Virginia, 1607, Powhatan had addressed a plea to John Smith that turned out prophetic. How authentic it is may be in doubt, but it is so much like so many Indian statements that it may be taken as, if not the rough letter of that first plea, the exact spirit of it. Quote, I have seen two generations of my people die. I know the difference between peace and war better than any man in my country. 
I am now grown old and must die soon. My authority must ascend to my brothers, Opichapan, Opechan Kano, and Katato, then to my two sisters, and then to my two daughters. I wish them to know as much as I do, and that your love to them may be like mine to you. Why will you take by force what you may have quietly by love? Why will you destroy us who supply you with food? What can you get by war? We can hide our provisions and run into the woods, then you will starve for wronging your friends. Why are you jealous of us? We are unarmed and willing to give you what you ask if you come in a friendly manner and not so simple as not to know. That it is much better to eat good meat, sleep comfortably, live quietly with my wives and children, laugh, and be merry with the English, and trade for their copper and hatchets than to run away from them and to lie cold in the woods, feed on acorns, roots, and such trash, and be so hunted that I can neither eat nor sleep. In these wars my men must sit up watching, and if a twig break they all cry out, quote, Here comes Captain Smith, unquote. So... I must end my miserable life. Take away your guns and swords, the cause of all our jealousy, or you may all die in the same manner." Unquote. When the pilgrims came to New England, they too were coming not to vacant land, but to territory inhabited by tribes of Indians. The governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, created the excuse to take Indian land by declaring the area legally a, quote, vacuum, unquote. The Indians, he said, had not subdued the land and therefore had only a natural right to it, but not a, quote, civil right, unquote. A natural right did not have legal standing. The Puritans also appealed to the Bible, Psalms 2, 8, quote, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, unquote. And to justify their use of force to take the land, they cited Romans 13, 2, Quote, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Unquote. The Puritans lived in uneasy truce with the Pequot Indians, who occupied what is now southern Connecticut and Rhode Island, but they wanted them out of the way. They wanted their land. And they seemed to want also to establish their rule firmly over Connecticut settlers in that area. The murder of a white trader, Indian kidnapper, and troublemaker became an excuse to make war on the Pequots in 1636. A punitive expedition left Boston to attack the Narragansett Indians on Block Island, who were lumped with the Pequots. As Governor Winthrop wrote, quote, They had commissioned to put to death the men of Block Island, but to spare the women and children, and to bring them away, and to take possession of the island, and from thence to go to the Pequots to demand the murderers of Captain Stone and other English, and one thousand fathom of wampum for damages, etc., and some of their children as hostages, which, if they should refuse, they were to obtain it by force." Unquote. The English landed and killed some Indians, but the rest hid in the thick forests of the island, and the English went from one deserted village to the next, destroying crops. Then they sailed back to the mainland and raided Pequot villages along the coast, destroying crops again. One of the officers of that expedition in his account gives some insight into the Pequots they encountered. Quote, the Indians spying of us came running in multitudes along the waterside, crying, What cheer, Englishmen, what cheer, what do you come for? They, not thinking we intended war, went on cheerfully. Unquote. So the war with the Pequots began. Massacres took place on both sides. The English developed a tactic of warfare used earlier by Cortes and later in the 20th century even more systematically. Deliberate attacks on non-combatants for the purpose of terrorizing the enemy. This is ethno-historian Francis Jennings' interpretation of Captain John Mason's attack on a Pequot village on the Mystic River near Long Island Sound. Quote, Mason proposed to avoid attacking Pequot warriors, which would have overtaxed his unseasoned, unreliable troops. Battle, as such, was not his purpose. Battle is only one of the ways to destroy an enemy's will to fight. Massacre can accomplish the same end with less risk, and Mason had determined that massacre would be his objective." Unquote. 
So the English set fire to the wigwams of the village. By their own account, quote, the captain also said we must burn them, and immediately stepping into the wigwam, brought out a firebrand and putting it into the mats with which they were covered, set the wigwams on fire, unquote. William Bradford, in his History of the Plymouth Plantation, written at the time, describes John Mason's raid on the Pequot village. Quote, Those that scaped the fire were slain with the sword, some hewed to pieces, others run through with their rapiers, so as they were quickly dispatched, and very few escaped. It was conceived they thus destroyed about four hundred at this time. It was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire, and the streams of blood quenching the same, and horrible was the stink and scent thereof, but the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice, and they gave the prayers thereof to God, who had wrought so wonderfully for them, thus to enclose their enemies in their hands, and give them so speedy a victory over so proud and insulting an enemy. As Dr. Cotton Mather, Puritan theologian, put it, it was supposed that no less than 600 Pequot souls were brought down to hell that day. The war continued. Indian tribes were used against one another and never seemed able to join together in fighting the English. Jennings sums up, quote, The terror was very real among the Indians, but in time they came to meditate upon its foundations. They drew three lessons from the Pequot War. First, that the Englishman's most solemn pledge would be broken whenever obligation conflicted with advantage. Second, that the English way of war had no limit of scruple or mercy. And third, that weapons of Indian making were almost useless against weapons of European manufacture. These lessons the Indians took to heart." Unquote. A footnote in Virgil Vogel's book, This Land Was Ours, 1972, says, the official figure on the numbers of Pequots now in Connecticut is 21 persons. Forty years after the Pequot War, Puritans and Indians fought again. This time it was the Wampanoags, occupying the south shore of Massachusetts Bay, who were in the way and also beginning to trade some of their land to people outside the Massachusetts Bay colony. Their chief, Massasoit, was dead. His son, Wamsuta, had been killed by Englishmen, and Wamsuta's brother, Medicom, later to be called King Philip by the English, became chief. The English found their excuse, a murder which they attributed to Medicom, and they began a war of conquest against the Wampanoags, a war to take their land. They were clearly the aggressors, but claimed they attacked for preventative purposes. As Roger Williams, more friendly to the Indians than most, put it, Quote, all men of conscience or prudence ply to windward to maintain their wars to be defensive. Unquote. Jennings says the elite of the Puritans wanted the war. The ordinary white Englishmen did not want it and often refused to fight. The Indians certainly did not want war, but they matched atrocity with atrocity. When it was over in 1676, the English had won, but their resources were drained. They had lost 600 men. 3,000 Indians were dead, including Metacom himself. Yet the Indian raids did not stop. For a while, the English tried softer tactics, but ultimately it was back to annihilation. The Indian population of 10 million that lived north of Mexico when Columbus came would ultimately be reduced to less than a million. Huge numbers of Indians would die from diseases introduced by the whites. A Dutch traveler in New Netherland wrote in 1656 that, quote, the Indians affirm that before the arrival of the Christians and before the smallpox broke out amongst them, they were ten times as numerous as they now are, and that their population had been melted down by this disease, whereof nine-tenths of them had died, unquote. When the English first settled Martha's Vineyard in 1642, the Wampanoags there numbered perhaps 3,000. There were no wars on that island, but by 1764, only 313 Indians were left there. Similarly, Block Island Indians numbered perhaps 1,200 to 1,500 in 1662, and by 1774 were reduced to 51. Behind the English invasion of North America, behind their massacre of Indians, their deception, their brutality, 
was that special powerful drive born in civilizations based on private property. It was a morally ambiguous drive, the need for space for land was a real human need, but in conditions of scarcity in a barbarous epoch of history ruled by competition, this human need was transformed into the murder of whole peoples. Roger Williams said it was, quote, a depraved appetite after the great vanities, dreams and shadows of this vanishing life, great portions of land, land in this wilderness, as if men were in as great necessity and danger for want of great portions of land as poor, hungry, thirsty seamen have after a sick and stormy, a long and starving passage. This is one of the gods of New England which the living and most high eternal will destroy and famish. Unquote. Was all this bloodshed and deceit from Columbus to Cortes, Pizarro, the Puritans, a necessity for the human race to progress from savagery to civilization? Was Morrison right in burying the story of genocide inside a more important story of human progress? Perhaps a persuasive argument can be made, as it was made by Stalin when he killed peasants for industrial progress in the Soviet Union, as it was made by Churchill explaining the bombings of Dresden and Hamburg, and Truman explaining Hiroshima. But how can the judgment be made if the benefits and losses cannot be balanced because the losses are either unmentioned or mentioned quickly? That quick disposal might be acceptable, Unfortunate, yes, but it had to be done to the middle and upper classes of the conquering and quote-unquote advanced countries. But is it acceptable to the poor of Asia, Africa, Latin America, or to the prisoners in Soviet labor camps, or the blacks in urban ghettos, or the Indians on reservations, to the victims of that progress, which benefits a privileged minority in the world? Was it acceptable, or just inescapable? to the miners and railroaders of America, the factory hands, the men and women who died by the hundreds of thousands from accidents or sickness, where they worked or where they lived, casualties of progress. And even the privileged minority must it not reconsider with that practicality which even privilege cannot abolish the value of its privileges when they become threatened by the anger of the sacrificed, whether in organized rebellion, unorganized riot, or simply those brutal individual acts of desperation labeled crimes by law and the state. If there are necessary sacrifices to be made for human progress, is it not essential to hold to the principle that those to be sacrificed must make the decision themselves? We can all decide to give up something of ours, but do we have the right to throw into the pyre the children of others? or even our own children, for a progress which is not nearly as clear or present as sickness or health, life or death. What did people in Spain get out of all that death and brutality visited on the Indians of the Americas? For a brief period in history, there was the glory of a Spanish empire in the Western Hemisphere. As Hans Koning sums it up in his book, Columbus, His Enterprise, quote, for all the gold and silver stolen and shipped to Spain did not make the Spanish people richer. It gave their kings an edge in the balance of power for a time, a chance to hire more mercenary soldiers for their wars. They ended up losing those wars anyway, and all that was left was a deadly inflation, a starving population, the rich richer, the poor poorer, and a ruined peasant class." Unquote. Beyond all that, how certain are we that what was destroyed was inferior? Who were these people who came out on the beach and swam to bring presents to Columbus and his crew, who watched Cortes and Pizarro ride through their countryside, who peered out of the forests at the first white settlers of Virginia and Massachusetts? Columbus called them Indians because he miscalculated the size of the earth. In this book, we too call them Indians, with some reluctance because it happens too often that people are saddled with names given them by their conquerors. And yet, there is some reason to call them Indians because they did come perhaps 25,000 years ago from Asia across the land bridge of the Bering Straits, later to disappear underwater, to Alaska. Then they moved southward seeking warmth and land in a trek lasting thousands of years that took them into North America, then Central and South America. In Nicaragua, Brazil, and Ecuador, their petrified footprints can still be seen, along with the print of bison who disappeared about 5,000 years ago. 
so they must have reached South America at least that far back. Widely dispersed over the great landmass of the Americas, they numbered approximately 75 million people by the time Columbus came, perhaps 25 million in North America. Responding to the different environments of soil and climate, they developed hundreds of different tribal cultures, perhaps 2,000 different languages. They perfected the art of agriculture and figured out how to grow maize, corn, which cannot grow by itself and must be planted, cultivated, fertilized, harvested, husked, and shelled. They ingeniously developed a variety of other vegetables and fruits, as well as peanuts and chocolate and tobacco and rubber. On their own, the Indians were engaged in the great agricultural revolution that other peoples in Asia, Europe, and Africa were going through about the same time. While many of the tribes remained nomadic hunters and food gatherers in wandering egalitarian communes, others began to live in more settled communities where there was more food, larger populations, more divisions of labor among men and women, more surplus to feed chiefs and priests, more leisure time for artistic and social work, for building houses. About a thousand years before Christ, while comparable constructions were going on in Egypt and Mesopotamia, the Zuni and Hopi Indians of what is now New Mexico had begun to build villages consisting of large, terraced buildings nestled in among cliffs and mountains for protection from enemies with hundreds of rooms in each village. Before the arrival of the European explorers, they were using irrigation canals, dams, were doing ceramics, weaving baskets, making cloth out of cotton. By the time of Christ and Julius Caesar, there had developed in the Ohio River Valley a culture of so-called mound builders, Indians who constructed thousands of enormous sculptures out of earth, sometimes in the shapes of huge humans, birds, or serpents, sometimes as burial sites, sometimes as fortifications. One of them was three and a half miles long, enclosing a hundred acres. These mound builders seem to have been part of a complex trading system of ornaments and weapons from as far off as the Great Lakes, the Far West, and the Gulf of Mexico. About AD 500, as this mound builder culture of the Ohio Valley was beginning to decline, another culture was developing westward, in the valley of the Mississippi, centered on what is now St. Louis. It had an advanced agriculture, included thousands of villages, and also built huge earthen mounds as burial and ceremonial places near a vast Indian metropolis that may have had 30,000 people. The largest mound was a hundred feet high, with a rectangular base larger than that of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. In the city, known as Cahokia, were tool makers, hide dressers, potters, jewelry makers, weavers, salt makers, copper engravers, and magnificent one funeral blanket was made of 12,000 shell beads. From the Adirondacks to the Great Lakes and what is now Pennsylvania and Upper New York lived the most powerful of the Northeastern tribes, the League of the Iroquois, which included the Mohawks, people of the Flint, Onedas, people of the Stone, Onondagas, people of the mountain, Cayugas, people at the landing, and Senecas, great hill people, thousands of people bound together by a common Iroquois language. In the vision of the Mohawk chief, Hewatha, the legendary Tekaniwida spoke to the Iroquois, quote, We bind ourselves together by taking hold of each other's hands so firmly and forming a circle so strong that if a tree should fall upon it, it could not shake nor break it so that our people and grandchildren shall remain in the circle in security, peace, and happiness." Unquote. In the villages of the Iroquois, land was owned in common, worked in common. Hunting was done together, and the catch was divided among the members of the village. Houses were considered common property and were shared by several families. The concept of private ownership of land and homes was foreign to the Iroquois. A French Jesuit priest who encountered them in the 1650s wrote, quote, No poor houses are needed among them because they are neither mendicants nor paupers. Their kindness, humanity, and courtesy not only makes them liberal with what they have, but causes them to possess hardly anything except in common. Unquote. Women were important and respected in Iroquois society. Families were matrilineal. That is, the family line went down through the female members whose husbands joined the family, 
while sons who married then joined their wives' families. Each extended family lived in a longhouse. When a woman wanted a divorce, she set her husband's things outside the door. Families were grouped in clans, and a dozen or more clans might make up a village. The senior woman in the village named the men who represented the clans at village and tribal councils. They also named the 49 chiefs who were the ruling council for the five-nation confederacy of the Iroquois. The woman attended clan meetings, stood behind the circle of men who spoke and voted, and removed the men from office if they strayed too far from the wishes of the women. The women tended the crops and took general charge of village affairs while the men were always hunting or fishing, and since they supplied the moccasins and food for warring expeditions, they had some control over military matters. As Gary B. Nash notes in his fascinating study of early America, Red, White, and Black, Quote, Thus, power was shared between the sexes, and the European idea of male dominancy and female subordination in all things was conspicuously absent in Iroquois society. Unquote. Children in Iroquois society, while taught the cultural heritage of their people and solidarity with the tribe, were also taught to be independent, not to submit to overbearing authority. They were taught equality in status and the sharing of possessions. The Iroquois did not use harsh punishment on children. They did not insist on early weaning or early toilet training, but gradually allowed the child to learn self-care. All of this was in sharp contrast to European values as brought over by the first colonists, a society of rich and poor controlled by priests, by governors, by male heads of families. For example, the pastor of the Pilgrim Colony, John Robinson, thus advised his parishioners how to deal with their children. Quote, and surely there is in all children a stubbornness and stoutness of mind arising from natural pride, which must, in the first place, be broken and beaten down, that so the foundation of their education being laid in humility and tractableness, other virtues may, in their time, be built thereon. Unquote. Gary Nash describes Iroquois culture. Quote, no laws and ordinances, sheriffs and constables, judges and juries, or courts or jails. The apparatus of authority in European societies were to be found in the northeast woodlands prior to European arrival. Yet boundaries of acceptable behavior were firmly set. Though priding themselves on the autonomous individual, the Iroquois maintained a strict sense of right and wrong. He who stole another's food or acted invalorously in war was shamed by his people and ostracized from their company until he had atoned for his actions and demonstrated to their satisfaction that he had morally purified himself. Unquote. Not only the Iroquois, but other Indian tribes behaved the same way. In 1635, Maryland Indians responded to the governor's demand that if any of them killed an Englishman, the guilty one should be delivered up for punishment according to English law. The Indians said, quote, It is the manner amongst us Indians that if any such accident happen, we do redeem the life of a man that is so slain with a hundred arms length of beads, and since that you are here strangers and come into our country, you should rather conform yourselves to the customs of our country than impose yours upon us." Unquote. So, Columbus and his successors were not coming into an empty wilderness, but into a world which in some places was as densely populated as Europe itself, where the culture was complex, where human relations were more egalitarian than in Europe, and where the relations among men, women, children, and nature were more beautifully worked out than perhaps any place in the world. They were people without a written language, but with their own laws, their poetry, their history, kept in memory and passed on in an oral vocabulary more complex than Europe's, accompanied by song, dance, and ceremonial drama. They paid careful attention to the development of personality, intensity of will, independence and flexibility, passion and potency, to their partnership with one another and with nature. John Collier, an American scholar who lived among Indians in the 1920s and 1930s in the American Southwest, said of their spirit, quote, Could we make it our own, there would be an eternally inexhaustible earth and a forever lasting peace, unquote. 
Perhaps there is some romantic mythology in that, but the evidence from European travelers in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries put together recently by an American specialist on Indian life, William Brandon, is overwhelmingly supportive of much of that quote-unquote myth. Even allowing for the imperfection of myths, it is enough to make us question, for that time and ours, the excuse of progress in the annihilation of races, and the telling of history from the standpoint of the conquerors and leaders of Western civilization. This has been A People's History of the United States from 1492 to present, written by Howard Zinn, read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz.